Well, hello, folks. I think everybody's in from the waiting room. Hello. I'm Alice Hutchinson, the owner of Birds Books, an independent bookstore in Bethel, Connecticut, and I am honored to be the host of Write America. The aim of this series has been to keep the country back on a correct, productive course of freedom, justice, equality, and plain human kindness. Write America is a literary series created by author Roger Rosenblatt, featuring award-winning, nationally renowned authors and new and emerging writers in readings and conversations each week about how books and art might bridge the deep divisions in our nation. Write America celebrates the quiet power of art in our lives, the unifying power of the highest uses of language. In novels, stories, essays, and poems, we recognize one another as parts of the human family, one family. Roger Rosenblatt, the creator of Write America, puts it this way. Writing makes justice desirable, evil intelligible, grief endurable, and love possible. So with that, I welcome you to the final episode of Write America. If you missed our previous episode with Carl Phillips, Gail Mazur, and Adam Gopnik, you can go to Bird's Book's Write America page and link to the episode easily. All of our recordings are now on our Write America YouTube channel for you to watch at any time. Tonight's episode is also being recorded, so if you miss something, you can go back and rewatch. The link is right on the front page of our website. Tonight, we are hosting readings by in conversation with Laura Tucker and Roger Rosenblatt. During the episode, please feel free to make comments in the chat. We do ask that you remain muted, however. Our first speaker is Laura Renee Tucker. Laura Renee Tucker, Laura's, Laura has over 30 years advocating for racial and social justice throughout the New York area. She's involved with the Sisters Writing Salon, Women Writers in Bloom Poetry Salon, and is an alumni of the Louis Reyes Rivera Writing Workshop. She is now conducting poetry therapy workshops for Stony Brook Southampton's Hospital Welcome Wellness Program, working with people with life-threatening illnesses and is presently the poetry editor of African Voices Literary Magazine, as well as an intern for the Southampton African American Museum. She was Roger Rosenblatt's assistant, assistant for her first class at Stony Brook's Summer Writing Conference. Laura's motivation is to write about her father's contributions as a Tuskegee Airman. Formerly a corporate interior designer for the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, a credentialed alcohol and drug counselor, and a licensed social worker and psychotherapist, she is now a writer until further notice. Please welcome to the screen, Laura Renee Tucker. You need to unmute, Derry. Yep. There you go. Hi. Hello, how is everyone? Thank you so much, Alice. Thank you, Lindsay, for your emails. And Roger, thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity and these, this wonderful series. Um, I'm going to share with you something that I just, I've been working on, but this is like the opening for my father. And then um, my father, just to be quick, got, uh, was a Tuskegee Airman, but it was a little more than some, more than that. And I found out later that he probably was involved with this person whom I'm gonna share about in doing some um, reconnaissance work and also doing being a spy. And I have to find out and I have to write about it because I just imagine having a child um, in which I don't, but if I did, I would want them to know what their granddaddy did. And I definitely want children that look like me to know that there was a man that looked like them that did some really good work for this country. So, but we're gonna learn about this other person that was part of my father's life and it's called Burying Arthur. At 14, you think you know everything. You also think you can remember everything. The problem is your brain isn't fully developed and what you know is a fraction of what you will know and forget. I can now admit that I remember almost everything or enough. I can't remember the exact date of Arthur's funeral, nor the weekday, nor the month of the year or season. I tried to remember by attempting to recall clothing or hairstyles, 
but I never really paid much attention to those details. Now, if there was only a song I associated with 1974, a food, a smell, or some television show. I was up early that day. I can remember the three of us moving slowly and deliberately through the apartment. I knew exactly what I was supposed to do, get myself ready and stay out of the way. Dad was on autopilot. I slipped into the bathroom after mom and performed my morning routine. The day's clothing laid out the night before like I would do for school. Mom, dad, and I, three meticulous Tauruses. I had been to enough non-Christian funerals to know how to carry myself. There were differences in the music and amens, but the grieving was familiar and felt just as ancient. It was also explained that funerals were not for the deceased, but for the living. Well, Arthur's funeral was for both. As I was getting ready, I thought of all the questions I still had for dad about Arthur and how I was still waiting for his answers. I considered him my grandpa and not just in quotes. He taught me how to say Gesundheit, Guten Morgen and count to Zen. Arthur had been a part of my 14 years of life in and out whether it was a holiday, birthday, or just a Sunday afternoon, dad and I would visit. But I knew there was more to Arthur. There was more to Arthur and daddy. And that morning I couldn't stop the questions swirling in my head from coming out of my mouth. I remember talking to dad in our family lecture hall, the kitchen. He was preparing breakfast, oatmeal, when I lovingly ambushed him. He usually was more forthcoming with food. Will we make it in time for the service? I think we'll be okay, Dad replied. Are we following the casket to the cemetery? Will we be in the front? Yes, we'll be following the hearse. I paused a teenage second, deliberating if I should ask, oh hell, is anyone else showing up? I might have been full of questions, but I, that didn't mean I was going to get any answers. Being a psychologist's daughter, I learned to ask the questions I could until I couldn't, then quietly try to figure the rest out myself. That day, I had some work to do. I learned to get as much information in life as possible. Too many people don't take the time to get answers and take too many chances. I was taught rarely take chances, but I take them. Are the death certificates in the front chest? Sorry, <laughs> let me just do that. I, I learned to, to get as much information as possible. Too many people don't take the time to get answers and take too many chances. I was taught to rarely take chances, but I take them. Mom came into the TV room. She looked like she was going to church. Her crisp suit and long, low-heeled slingback pumps were a part of her weekday uniform, but she added the pearls and that church touch for the occasion. Was Arthur as special to mom as he was to dad? Are you ready? Yep, I replied. She collected her pocketbook and sat with me in the TV room waiting for dad to finish his breakfast. I don't even remember what I was watching. Ever since my first experience with death, I used to think there was a particular smell to funerals. I don't know how I conjured that reaction, but I can only explain it is my creation of a negative association to death. It didn't smell right. I recall the smell being earthy, mixed with a chemical-like or alcohol aroma, like potting soil, nail polish remover, and sweet flowers. I could even conjure up the smell. It would materialize whenever I was at a funeral home, near a casket, or even at the thought of death. Like Pavlov's pups, I got triggered, but not by a bell, but a smell. Olfactory memories are powerful. A smell that I probably experienced as a toddler was still in my nose. A smell I couldn't forget and never did. 
when dad drove over the Cross Bay Bridge, I watched mom open the, a window a crack and reach for the radio. I thought maybe she would have mercy on my teenage soul and turn, it, turn the radio to WBLS. That was the r and it's a music station, but she wouldn't. She went right to 1010 Winds News. We give you 10 minutes and we give you the world. I barely remember the car ride to the Rockways. I remember the route, but not the destination. There wasn't much traffic. I had my crocheting and a small spiral binder in my oversized pocketbook, all my distractions. I started looking up when the car pulled over. Dad left me and mom in the car. Arthur and the hearse were waiting for us. I examined the vehicle. It was a Cadillac. One day my last ride will be a Cadillac and I'll be chauffeured also. I believe we waited maybe 10 minutes before we headed to the cemetery. Tent and winds helped me keep time. As dad got back in the car, I realized we really were the only ones following the hearse. Heading to Long Island were two vehicles, the hearse and dad's Plymouth satellite. I was used to seeing a caravan of cars with tags in the front and rear windows and headlights beaming. There was a long pause in my memory. I barely remember my immediate surroundings, the car, my parents, Arthur. The rest of the world was like a washed out watercolor. On the drive to Arthur's resting place, I recall the rhythm of the road. Then dad pulled up behind the hearse at the cemetery's main building and exited the car. Mom and I waited. We knew the drill. I came, when dad came out and gave us the all clear, I came out the side where my mother came out of. We walked up to my dad and just as we did, a lean, humble looking white man who favored Abraham Lincoln adjusted his shawl and asked dad about Arthur's family. My father looked the man straight in the eye. His family is here, he replied. He proceeded to introduce mom and me. I noticed the rabbi's eyes and shoulders soften. I looked up at him. I knew who he was instinctively. He looked holy, but not Jesus holy, Moses holy. He looked Sorry. He looked at me and a smile bloomed on his face. He smiled as mom bobby pinned my hair with a dolly head like thingy. Dad pulled out his yarmulke and placed it on his head. The rabbi asked if we were familiar with the service and offered to explain everything. Dad assured him we did some homework and what we didn't know, we would happily follow his lead. Comfortably pleased, he asked us to follow him. We got back in the car and continued to the grave site. Like an honor guard, the three of us looked like we had everything rehearsed. That wasn't true. We were just perfect. Negro Gothic, the talented Tim Tuckers, W.E.B. Du Bois would be proud. I remember being on my toes, sitting erect, staying alert, following instructions and being gracious. I watched my parents for cues, listened for instructions, checked where Arthur was. Funny, I don't remember that funeral smell. As I stood with my parents at the gravesite, I looked down at the tombstone. I was looking for Lottie. Behind the newly turned soil, I saw her name. I felt a wave of relief. Lottie, his wife was there and they'll be together again. The rabbi could not stop thanking dad after the service. He stood and held my father's hand and shook it and both men were smiling. They did what Europeans do, that men's hug, it was cute. Later, dad shared with me, the rabbi had tears in his eyes and was moved. 
I could see there was something in dad's eyes also. I could see it was far more than a duty or just doing the right thing. Looking at Arthur's simple pine coffin with the tongue and groove corners and wooden peg legs for nails, it hit me. This unadorned rectangle was holding a Jewish man I called my grandpa. Every birthday, every holiday, countless Sundays, dad and I visited Arthur and his parakeet. With Arthur, I learned reverence for my elders, no matter who he was. I learned that he was truly family, no matter what they said. On that day and always, Arthur mattered. We buried Arthur and nothing else mattered. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Roger Rosenblatt. Roger Rosenblatt is the author of five New York Times notable books and three Times bestsellers, including the memoirs Kayak Morning and Making Toast. He's written seven off-Broadway plays, including Free Speech in America, named one of the Times 10 best plays of 1991, and lives in the basement and does nothing, his one-person play about the writing life for which he played jazz piano. The Distinguished professor, professor of English and Writing Emeritus at Stony Brook University, he held the Brid, Briggs Copeland appointment in teaching of writing at Harvard. Among his honors are two George Polk Awards, the Peabody and the Emmy for his essays in Time Magazine and on PBS. A Fulbright to Ireland where he played on the Irish international basketball team, seven honorary doctorates and the Kenyon Review Award for Lifetime Literary Achievement. Please welcome to the screen, Roger Rosenblatt. Thank you, Alice. And I can't imagine anything uh, nicer or more gratifying than to be on with my dear Laura, uh, who among other things has just read the most beautiful account, with, which I am eager to get to after I do a little reading on my own. So I'll read a couple of things. This is from Kayak Morning, and it's included in the story I am. Story I am. Sorry. Um, if I was mute before, I will just tell you that I'm going to read a, a few couple of things. One is from, uh, from Kayak Morning, which is included in a collection called The Story I Am, which is a collection of my writing on writing, which I came out with a few years ago. So this is from Kayak Morning. The characters in a novel I'm writing have lost control of themselves. The one-eyed hag has become a two-legged dog who travels solo in a red cart and plays bluegrass on the banjo. The gatekeeper has become a beekeeper. He's so out of things, he tries to open and close a gate made of bees he drinks. The hero of the piece is spread in a hundred directions like the roots of an old tree. As for the villains, there are so many by now, I'd be better off yoking them under a single name. This is what happens when you do not pay attention to the novels you write. Oh yes, and Death, a character called Death has stuck his Roman nose into the plot. He plays a vampire who needs a transfusion. It's a bad idea, don't you think, to give a transfusion to a vampire? I sometimes wish I owned a shop instead where I sold coconuts or Roger d'art or Bowie knives, anything but books. People would come to my shop to get things they want and I would give them what they want and we both would take satisfaction in the transaction. The trouble with writing is you give people what they don't want. And by the time they realize they needed what you gave them, they have forgotten where your shop is located. You, meanwhile, never noticed them in the first place. You were intent on your work which consists of patricide and theft. I read Cavafy the other day, cover to cover for the sole purpose of robbing his grave. There's only one point to writing. It allows you to do impossible things. Sure, most of the time it's chimney sweeping and dung removal or plastering. A lot of time writing is plastering or caulking or pointing up the bricks. But every so often there is a moment in the dead of morning when everything is still as starlight 
and something invades your room like a bird that has flown through the window and you are filled with as much joy as panic. And then you think, I can do anything. Next one doesn't have to do with writing as much as just sort of part of the writing life or a little anecdote that occurred with my family and my grandson, James, when he was 20 months old. I'll show you James in a minute. But first, I'll read you my little story with James, who was known as Bubbies in those days. He was known as Bubbies for a couple of years, and then the insistent world of respectability made itself known, and he became James. My grandson, Bubbies, nay, J James, sits in my lap in the den. He locks his hands behind his head when he relaxes. I do the same. We sit there in a lopsided brown leather chair, same pose, sitting in tandem like luge drivers. One evening, he points to a shelf to his left and says, book. He indicates the letters of James Joyce, edited by Stuart Gilbert. It seems an ambitious choice for a 20, 23 month old boy, but I take down the book and prop it before us. Dear Bubbies, I begin. I went to the beach today and played in the sand. I also built a castle. I hope you will come play with me soon. Love, James Joyce. Bubby seems content, so I read another. Dear Bubbies, went to the playground today, tried the slide. It was a little scary. I like the swings better. I can go very high, just like you. Love, James Joyce. Bubbies turns the pages. I occasionally amuse myself with an invented letter closer to the truth of Joyce's life sorry, of Joyce's life and personality. Dear Bubbies, I hate the Catholic Church and I'm leaving Ireland forever. Love, James Joyce. It tickles me that Bubbies has chosen to latch on to a writer who gladly would have stepped on a baby to get a good review. I try to put back the book, but he detects an implicit announcement of his bedtime and he protests, Joyce. Eventually, he resigns himself to the end of his day puts the book back himself and quietly says, Joyce. Here's Bobby or James. You can see him at that very time with, <laughs> with a little guy holding letters to James Joyce. And I'm gonna read has to do with Valentine's Day, which is coming up. It's a nice occasion. And this is from the Book of Love. Uh, came out a number of years ago. Uh, improvisations on a crazy little thing. I noticed that with subtitles and other things, a lot of music comes into my work, but I'm, I don't do it intentionally or collect it. So it's just a, a kind of uh, music in your system, I guess. I like music, I like playing it, I like hearing it. So from the Book of Love, improvisations on a crazy little thing. Should we mix it up this Valentine's Day? I mean, a knockdown, drag out, no holds bar, mano a mano, Donnie Brook. Tell you what, let's make love instead. Let's do both and fight between the sheets. Does that make sense? Does anything about love make sense? Love is irrational, delirium, which is why neither of us would want to be one of those gods graced with eternal life. Because if you have eternal life, why panic? Where's the fire? But if you're mortal and are we ever, Carpe diem, carpe whatever frantic impulse comes charging through your heart. So what is it to be, baby? A shot to the kisser or embraceable you? I love a Gershwin too, and how about you? Plant one on me. The safest place to be in a tornado is a storm cellar. The safest place to be in a tornado is a railroad apartment on Bleecker Street or a Motel 6 or a Williams Sonoma or a bank vault or a North Korean prison. The safest place to be in a tornado is your arms, you said, and you thought you meant it, but you didn't. Love is no safer than a bread knife. Take the storm cellar. Tea for two and two for tea and me for you in a cottage small like a waterfall. I don't think so. Embrace the peril. If we're going to pick our song, let's make it that old black magic and revel in the spin we're in. How do conservatives fall in love? Conservatively, I suppose, like porcupines. 
Love may be better suited to liberals for whom disorder is a work of the imagination. Within the blink of a black eye, you can be enthralled by me, disgusted with me, appalled, enchanted, smitten, bored, bored with me, forever mine, forever through with me, analyze that. The trick is not to forget that we love each other because couples do that. They forget to remember as if love were keys to misplace or a purse to leave in an airport. What, did I slip your mind? Did you slip mine, my irreplaceable you? my sweet erasable you. You'd be so nice to come home to, that is you or Tracy the waitress with the boobs I glimpsed at Applebee's last Tuesday. Unforgettable, that's what you are not unless I concentrate on you. Love is a holy mess. Love is a holy mess. You were not meant for me, I was not meant for you. Yet there we were in the snow our first night together. The quiet luster of you composed like a Gershwin tune, like embraceable of you. While I, a whooping rhinoceros, stomped about in boots, a rhino in boots, until we stopped, stood thigh to thigh, looked up, caught the moon between the tangles of the clouds. My heart fell open like a knot. Be my valentine in a blizzard, where the air is so thick we cannot see two feet ahead of us, and we flail about snow blind without a GPS, be my GPS to the tundra of the Klondike, and I'll be yours. The outer world of fanatics hates at the drop of a hat. Let us love as fanatically unhinged. Oh, promise me nothing. Is that you standing before me in the whiteout? Come to Papa. Do. I'm going to read from Cataract Blues which uh, is coming out actually on Valentine's Day. Um, but before I do, I wanted to say a couple of things that are important, not just to me, but to all of us on Right America. Linda Paston died yesterday. Linda's in Cataract Blues. Uh, one of her amazing poems is called Cataract. And a quote from it is, I am afraid of so much clarity, so much light. Afraid or not, that's all she, was, all she brought us. All that she was in the business of clarity and light. She was a light and so much fun. So much fun, such a good friend, a wonderful writer, thoroughly wonderful person. So we send our sympathy and our love to Rachel, her gifted daughter who also read on Right America. And we send her our love in remembrance of the wonderful Linda Paston. Something about cataract blues that might interest you. The drawings are by Jules Pfeiffer. And that is truly a gift. I was truly a gift to me that uh, Jules uh, was uh, willing to do the illustrations. I was gonna say illustrations, they're not really, they are works of art in themselves, not more than companion pieces to a text. But you see what he can do, even with a cover. Uh, that's supposed to be a sort of version of me playing the piano. The cover plays piano better than I do. But you see what he can do. And this, the, the thing about the book is about secret music. And he imagined a secret music. Actually, he imagined all of it because his wonderful wife, Joan, had to read him, read him Cataract Blues because Jules has, um, what's the? Mac Macular degeneration, thank you. Macular degeneration, uh, and it's at a very serious, at a serious level. Uh, and uh, so he can't read, he can't read. So Joan read him, Joan the novelist, and his wife read him Cataract Blues. Jules let it play through his imagination and drew this wonderful drawings. Wanted to show you this, the one on the cover, and I wanted to show you Pat Swaller. Pat Swaller. Uh, comes in for a lot of praise in this book, but take a look at Fats. And that is just as good as it gets. And it's just, it's just perfect. Oh, you, you hear him playing Harlem Stride piano by just looking at this wonderful picture of Jules. Jules can do everything and I am blessed that he is my friend and that he drew the pictures that went along with my book. Cataract Blues, it's hard to tell what it's about really. It's about three things, uh, memory, and mystery and the color blue. 
color blue coming blaring into my life when I had cataract surgery. My cataract surgeon, Dr. Cole, uh, opened the world to me with the color blue. A, a particular blue is particularly shielded uh, by cataract. And then uh, I saw, and so the whole book is sort of filtered through blue. So I'll read you just the opening of the book and give you a sense of what it's about. It moves really like the riff on a piano. It's called, um, it's called running the keyboard, a phrase I gather. I, mean, I asked my jazz piano teacher what it was. And he said, you made it up. So I made it up. But it's the idea of just moving your hands along the keys, finding the right notes, finding the wrong notes and making them up the right notes, which is the essence of jazz. The human eye has rods, cells used for the perception of light located at the outer edges of the retina, which allow us to see certain things more clearly out of the corners of our eyes. Colors, on the other hand, are perceived by cones at the center of the eye. In my eye, I'm in my odd way of seeing things, this means that my recent enthrallment with the color blue is the direct product of looking straight ahead, whereas the music of the blues played at the far, plays at the far sides of my mind. One is front and center, the other a ghost in the wings. When I see blue and feel blue, I'm using my whole eye. Charles Cole, my cataract surgeon, travels the world using his skills in the neediest places. In Africa, he tells me, the cataracts are so thick, they form a black shield over the eyes. Villagers who suffer cataracts are legally blind and need to be led around by sighted people who hold one end of a stick as the blind person holds the other end. The sighted person leads the blind one by gently pulling the stick in the desired direction. In the villages where Dr. Cole has worked his magic, there are piles of discarded sticks outside his clinic. These piles of sticks become accidental monuments that may remind the villagers of the times that they could see and the times that they were helpless and they were helpful to one another. Such transactions speak for the beautiful gestures people are occasionally capable of. The blind man at the short end of the stick had to imagine everything around him, though the help he was given was real. He even imagined the appearance of his help by necessity, he saw inward where the vistas are illimitable. He was helpless, but he saw. Once cured and seeing, what did he think every day when he passed the village piles of sticks at the clinic? Relief and gratitude only, wonder at Western science, dazzlement at all he could newly see, or a pang of longing. Attempting to account for the fact that the ancient Irish soldiers lost every battle they got into, the poet Seamus O'Shiel, 1886 to 1954, posited it was a secret music the soldiers heard, a sad, sweet plea for pity and for peace that distracted them from the, right, from the fighting at hand. And so they lost, said O'Shiel, not because they lacked skill, strategy, stamina, courage, or the right weapons, but rather because they were sensitive to a spiritual sound, a tune that beckoned them like the muted sirens toward an inner peace by which they simultaneously were elevated and doomed. You might say better to win the battle than forfeit the music, but think what the music brought, a sad, sweet plea for pity and for peace, something civilizing and gentle and superior in the long run to merely one more victory and one more war. I doubt that such receptivity comes naturally. One must cultivate an inner stillness capable of picking up the unplayed notes, the nothing that is there, as Wallace Stevens said of snow. First, there is nothing, then the nothing becomes everything. The Irish warriors surrendered, surrendered not to the enemy, but to the mystery. Something will come to you, Richard Wilbur's assurance in waking to sleep. Like a queen who expects her chair to be there when she wishes to sit. Like a general scouting the enemy who expects a pair of binoculars to be placed in his hands when he needs them. Something essential will come to you without being summoned. I tell that to my writing students when they bemoan dry spells. They don't believe it, and then they do. There are sticks out there waiting to be held by two. 
There is a secret music out there waiting to sweep through you like the notes of a jazz riff. Trust it. Trust me. Something will come to you. And now, let Laura come to me so that we can talk about writing and her wonderful work. Hi there. Hi. How are you? I am just fine. The happier for seeing you, young lady. Yes. Well, I am ecstatic. I even gave you my nice background of all my goodies and stuff. Yes, I, I see that. <laughs> And even the Emmett Still. Emmett Still, <laughs> Emmett Still is a wonderful, it's been a wonderfully smart poster. You know, Thank just, you. It's, um, uh, it says everything. And you are not uh, old enough, but I am, to remember the original horror of Emmett Till. And as a child, it just, it burns its way through your heart and through your life. But on the positive side, yesterday, Jenny and I were in the post office and I was just, you know, just mailing something. And I saw that a stamp to Ernest J. Gaines came out. Now, I don't know if you know who Ernest J. J. Gaines is, because he's not, he's a, 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 a very good black author, but he's not one of the top ones you know it's not it's not he's not a uh, jimmy baldwin he's and, and richard mm -hmm. wright uh, another, mm -hmm. and i thought and i thought to myself and, and the guy behind the uh, counter was black and i said this is a great moment when you can make a stamp out of somebody who was very good but not done because of star power or anything just because he was good no matter what color he was and the and he knew it the guy uh, the guy on the, the counter uh, knew it Oh wow! I have to check. I have to check games out. Little, little, just little great moments in sports. That story, that story, that story that you read is gorgeous, and I, I, I can't tell you how many things you do right in it. For one thing, the pace is perfect. You take it just slow enough, but not so slow as to be to indicate to the reader that you're dragging, uh, you're dragging your feet. Your father comes alive in the story, yet he's hardly in the story. Arthur is more in the story uh, in the sense that the event, the sad event of uh, Arthur's funeral uh, is, uh, is there. But the friendship between them brings your dad to life uh, too. The, your, your wonderful dad who was in the Tuskegee uh, Airmen. And the pacing is perfect. Um, Thank you. Thank you. One, one day my last ride will be a Cadillac. Me too, babe. <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah it'll be that and and if they cremate me i want to be sprinkled over um denzel washington you're, you're giving me the creeps really i don't want any <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to be sprinkled over anybody <laughs> <laughs> and i i'm sure denzel does not want me anyway <laughs> <laughs> I, i'll be sure if i meet him to ask i've got a strange question for you <laughs> but it, this, this, the story, dear Laura, is as good as it gets. Have you published this yet? No. Well, it's, it's going to be published. Uh, pick pick mm -hmm. your spots well, because a lot of people deserve uh, uh, to read it. It's a picture oh, okay. of everything. It's a picture of your dad, a picture of yourself, a picture of your life, uh, both Black life and Jewish life, and the, uh, um, and, and, and the, the beauty of the affection uh, uh, between them, and the gentleness of it, the gentleness of it. You, you are gentle. The people in the story uh, are gentle, and you, you uh, finish the story um, thinking, "I've been into, I've been to an important place, and Laura, Laura Tucker has taken me there." Thank you, and, and you know, one of something. It was an important place to me, um, Arthur. Um, it's, till to this day, I don't know everything but I can remember the feelings. And he was my grandpa. Yeah. And, you know, and I didn't, my father's father passed away when I was one. So I never knew anyone. And he, he passed, and Arthur passed away, he was 84. Yeah. So I knew him in his el in elderly age, yeah. And he was wonderful. And he would, he would do grandpa's things. Like he, he would send me pictures because he was from Germany. He would send me pictures of Berlin and like the cathedrals and and I kept all of them, all the art, like art pieces and stuff. And, and he sent me my first um, guardian angel. 
And his wife used to, um, before she passed away, she used to, when I used to greet her, she used to grab my pudgy cheeks and go, oh, my little lipskin, you know. <laughs> that, 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 that is a Jewish threat. Uh, the, uh, 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 I, don't, I don't know how it was among African-Americans. I will tell you that every little Jewish boy and girl ran like hell when they saw a certain glint in the eye of an aunt or an uncle coming at you. <laughs> They're gonna grab your cheek and just make you, make you suffer. Well, you know, it's interesting because uh, my, my, I guess, opposite for that would be my mother. And when she give me that black woman look, that black mama look going, and then she'd look and go, do I need to help you? Yeah. Like, no, 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 you don't need to help me. I got this. Thank you. <laughs> but I have a treat. I have a treat for you. I'm, okay. I want to see if I can do this right. I'm not good at this. What do you got? What do you got there? That's my father's um, military card. How wonderful. How wonderful. Yeah. And, then, and he was 24 in this picture. And then, I don't know if this will, but this is a picture of him in his flight. What a, what a wonderful, handsome man he was. Oh, yeah. He was a good looking guy. I have to say, I have to admit, you know. So, I had what were um, the Mm -hmm. I was just going to ask you, were the Tuskegee Airmen honored and known when they were the Tuskegee Airmen, or did that happen after the war? Um, they were honored way after the war. Yeah. yeah. You know, come to think of it, I think that it was probably, I want to say Clinton um, presidency when they, they actually gave medals to some of the, um, and I don't know if it was all of them or just the particular ones that were in the, that, um, the fighting 99th, but I still need to find more out. I, I, I have my father's discharge papers, so I saw he got some medals. I saw where he was discharged. I'm just like, I, I can't wait. I just, I'm, I'm really anxious to, because I know I'm going to have to do a lot of freedom of information. With him. Oh yes, right, right, right. Yeah, because he had promised I had promised him I wouldn't write it until he passed away. Well, this book on your dad is going to be important and beautiful. And if the story that you just read us, which could be part of that book too, uh, you can play it both ways. You can have it as a separate story, and certainly as part of the uh, part of the whole uh, part of the whole story. Um, you're going to do a wonderful job on that, and it's going to be one of the rare. One of the rare, th rare theses that is actually a book just there. It's going to be there and ready to, to be a book. It won't be a thesis that uh, has to be uh, twisted into a different shape. So uh, all, all, of, all of this will have proved worthwhile. Yeah, and I'm challenged because I also have an, another hand being my social work life and being me, I guess I was like the Forrest Gump of... Um, social work and the like, but I have so much adventure that I also have um, put together stuff that I call Love Letters from the Margins, which is, mm -hmm. you know, kind of exalting mental health, people who have mental health being human and, and the everyday stuff. So I'm pulled, but my father's stuff is going, my, the work I have to do with my father, um, it's, it's going to be hard, I know. It's, it's going to be hard because I have a feeling that there's going to be some things that are going to be a little, a little painful, especially if he was a part of um, the project I think he was a part of. There's, you know, because it was, it, I think my father helped um, get German Jewish scientists out of Nazi occupied Germany. But I'm sure that in that, they might have had to take people who were identified as Nazis out too. Um, the, uh, just tell the story. Yeah. It, 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 uh, it's fascinating. It's important. And in your loving hands, it will be beautiful. Thank you. Well, thanks to you. I have to tell you something and I'm going to, I'm going to bust, uh, I'm busting you right now. I just got to have to say it. I was your fan. I was a wonk when it came to you as a, as a, I won't say kid. Yeah, I won't do that to you, but um, PBS, I waited for your commentaries. I literally would turn, and if you weren't on, I might 
listen to some of the news and then go on. But I waited for your stuff. I was your fan. I was a big fan of yours. I, I'm I'm honored and I'm glad. I'll tell you how funny how weird television is. I haven't done that uh, in. I did it for 23 years and I stopped in 2003. Okay, this is uh, 2022. I still get stopped on the street by people who say, I really enjoyed your essay last night. That's the, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I, I'm polite, you know, I just let, I let it happen. But it shows you there's a kind of craziness that goes on with the visual that uh, you don't have in writing. Um, I, I'm glad we invented the form actually on the news hour on McNeil era. I was proud of them. I was proud to be associated with that wonderful show, that wonderful program, but it wasn't real writing. Real writing, you, you create the image. With television writing, the image is there. And I'll, I'll tell you, if, if uh, any time I was writing an essay and the producers by some unusual accident put the wrong picture with something, people would only remember the picture. They would never remember uh, the words. So um, I was proud to do it and happy to do it, but it really wasn't. It really wasn't the real thing. Well, it was something that made me know that I had a voice and that I uh, had an opinion. And if I write it down, maybe someone would read it and kind of like align with it. I'm like, cool, I could do this. Well, Not then, Laura, then the whole thing is worth it. <laughs> and I'll send you your check tomorrow. Um, <laughs> Somebody's got it. <laughs> but I have something for you. Your one of your first articles, I won't tell you how young I was, 15, when you wrote it for the New Republic. Mm -hmm. Um, and it says here Roger Rosenblatt remembers his father. Ah, uh, yes, ma'am, that's right, that's right. Um, and, yeah, 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 yeah. So, I have to, I, I, I have to say that when I read what you remembered, I said. Lim needs to meet your father, or maybe they are meeting up there, you know? That would be that a nice thought that would be. <laughs> uh, maybe your dad could make my dad a little less grumpy. You know what? He probably could. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then you know, they could, they can be curmudgeons together. Oh, you that's, a, then you're talking about true heaven. <laughs> and I love the fact you were saying that your father's like Edward G. Robinson. He was. The, the uh, uh, all he needed was a cigar in his mouth and and, uh, and a gun in his hand. The uh, actually, actually, he was so tough he didn't need a gun in his hand. <laughs> and, and I love the way he kept you in the waiting room too. You know, oh, I, I, I I don't know if it, I wrote it in that piece, but I remember that's that's when I learned what twenty minutes meant. Twenty minutes meant an hour and a half because he would always say, <laughs> um, "Okay, Rob, just stay here." And he would take me on rounds. Uh, to the hospital. Mm -hmm. And he said, stay here, I'll be here 20 minutes. And I'd wait and I'd wait. And I was a sucker for maybe five of these things. And then I said, never mind. I'll, do, uh, I'll read the Encyclopedia Britannica, do something to kill the time. That's why I used to bring my little toys with me and with, when I was with my parents. You know, that's the only child thing. I knew I had to have something to play with. You know? It's good to write, it's a good thing to write about your folks. You're writing about your dad. And I, I I did that one piece on uh, on my father. I did another piece for time on my mother when she was uh, when she had Alzheimer's, when she died actually, and, and after Alzheimer's. And I know your mom has Alzheimer's uh, too. Um, it's not just the memorializing of uh, our parents whom we loved and honored, but you get a special kind of writing when you do that. It's a different kind of writing. Your vocabulary changes. Your uh, your language is. Um, uh, important and affectionate at the same time. So I'm very glad you're writing about your dad. Uh, and you'll, you may write about your mom too. I, 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 I have to, because <laughs> they both were phenomenal. My father was phenomenal. My mother still is. She's 97 now. Okay. Um, mm -hmm, she'll be 98 May 13th. Mm -hmm. My father would have been 102, <laughs> 103 May 3rd. <laughs> and, and, and I am going to be 63 May 8th. And um, which is maybe about, I guess, 200 and something in dog years. Um, <laughs> but yeah, but she, she has done a lot, especially out here in Sac Harbor, where she retired and became um, and helped with the Bridgehampton Day, Day Care Center, being an executive director for um, Gratis. Mm 
And so she's done a lot. And, you know, it's like giving. Like, 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 like mother, like daughter. Look at all the stuff you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but all of, I think my father and mother and I, we all were about, you know, being and giving. And I, I, I've always thought of um, Eleanor Roosevelt and what she said that she, she had to be useful. You know, that when yeah. she knows, that she knows when she wasn't useful anymore, it'd be time to go. The most uh, a, a wonderful fellow, Lewis Thomas, biologist uh, and, a, and a physician, um, talked to me when he was dying, actually. And uh, he said that he would be content if he knew that his life had been useful. And there was no question that his life had been useful. Mm -hmm. And that's how I feel about my life. You know, I'm, I'm one of those single, single, not married, no children. But all of, I consider every single person I came across as a social worker was my child, whether they were older than me or not. You know, I mean, I wanted to share a word with you. Mm. Ubuntu. Ubuntu. Do you know that word? I don't. Teach me. Ubuntu means I am because we are. And I thought of that when, you, when I was asked to be with you in this last episode, that what we need to carry on from this is Ubuntu, which is some um, South African, which basically is the teaching of community. Mm -hmm. It's that I, 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 this was a dream for me to do. I mean, I waited my whole adulthood to be able to go and write and write and write and write. <laughs> right, you know, but the thing is that when I met you that summer, and we met through Zoom. Come to think of it, we never met face we to never, face yet. We still COVID. haven't met. We still have. I still, for all I know, you don't exist. Well, for all I know, you could be black. <laughs> well, I think that I think that's closer than you are not existing. Okay, um, <laughs> but but the thing is that. I've always wanted to do this. And when I got in touch with you, you brought me into the community, which, you know, I, I, I knew for so long, I, I, I felt wanted. I, I feel like I'm home now. You, 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 create, you, you created everything that you have and all I did was notice it. Well, thank you for noticing. And thank you for, for, for embracing. You are so nurturing and just, and so giving, I I really appreciate it. And don't and don't cut me off now because I know you don't you know you want to. I'm going to I'm gonna, I am going to cut you off. It's totally embarrassing. Um, would you <laughs> would you tell me the word again? It's I'm going to spell it. It's U B U N T U. So what's the language? What's the language? It's um, African um, philosophy. Let me see. I'm looking. I'm trying to look at what I had pulled up because I knew you were going to ask me that, and I knew I had to research it. It's, it's South it's, African. It's, okay. it's oh, it, uh, but uh, it's a wonderful thing, and as a matter of fact, it's dead center on the whole business of Right America. Um, as you may remember, I led off our description in Right America with a Gwendolyn Gwendolyn Brooks quote: "We are mm -hmm. each other's harvest." And that's what that's saying. We are each other's hearts. You really have to believe that. Um, it's it's easy to say, oh well, it's sentimental and so forth and so on. Tough. It's um, it's the only way to live. And if we go back to the useful life, it's the only way to live a useful life. And it's about interdependency, and knowing that we all are connected in some way, and and the connectedness is important. You know. Absolutely. So, and, yeah, and and I love that quote you know, that just brings, it brings it all together. And this is my master class. I mean, I will forever be coming back. This is amazing. It's like I've, I've gone and I've looked for my bliss and I've found it. And it's like, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> so I'm, I'm carrying, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna tell you, I'm starting an open mic with um, the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of so um, South Fork. We're going to be starting that next month, the first Fridays, doing an open mic, which I am consistently going to have out here so that when writers come out, 
they'll have a place to read. If you have something, you know, and, and also musicians. So that's the way I'm going to carry this um, Right America. I want to yeah. see the nurturing being carried on. And for God's sake, I want to see Sag Harbor jumping with writers again. Yeah. Well, Laura, after seeing you in the audience for so, so, so many episodes, it's wonderful to have you join us as a participant. It's just your work is lovely. So I Thank just, you. it was so meaningful. I really just enjoyed it. And Roger, it goes without saying, I love Cataract Blues and I love all your work, but the dialogue that you have is is right America. It is, it is exactly what I always understood Roger to hope for that this series would be and it just never disappoints. Um, I am going to ask each of you if you would like to make closing comments, uh, Laura first and then Roger, and then I have a few things to say. So if you don't mind, I'm just going to turn it over to you, Laura. Okay, well, very quickly, I want to shout out to Paul Harding, Luann, Amy Hempel, Meg Wilser. These are just people that I've embraced in the past few years and I just wanted to lift you guys up you all are wonderful and I wanted to say that um these master classes are just wonderful and I want to say Roger thank you for making lemonade out of lemons you know especially during the COVID it was when when people are so boxed up and with me I was in such pain to have someone that you know in, in a vehicle it's just so wonderful. But one thing I want to stress to everyone out there is really two things. One is, please carry this with you. You know, be, be brave. Don't, don't be afraid. Say what's on your mind. Say what's in your heart. And the, another thing I just want to share is one more thing. Do you please go to the edge of your knowledge and take one more step. That's what I've done all my life. And I will always be a forever learner because of that. And I get joy in learning. And now I found my joy in writing. So I have to thank everyone that's touched me and I hope that I touched you. But go out there and kick butt, guys. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> well, my, I just have some thanks to give. I think I saw, I, I, I may have just dreamed it, Lauren Lemon Jelly's name as one of the people who's watching this episode. I've been trying to reach Lauren for a, so, uh, a long time, so I to thank her for all that she did at the beginning of this. As Alice has taken the, the ball and, and run with it uh, gorgeously for all this time, Lauren got us started in, uh, in Huntington and in the book review in, in Huntington. Um, it was a wonderful presence and lovely in every possible way, beloved by the writers, just as Alice is. So if it is Lauren and you are there, I thank you. I want to thank Frank Imperial. Frank does all the technical work for us. And when anything broke down and things did break down, uh, particularly before we started to use Zoom, uh, Frank would just simply quietly, either remotely or in person, fix everything. Uh, he, does, he did it gently. He was an artist with technology. And he was particularly valuable for writers uh, who don't know which end of a pencil to use. So it made it, it made it particularly valuable to have somebody who knew everything and did everything so uh, smoothly uh, and in such a civilized way. I want to thank Lindsay. I don't, can't really thank Lindsay enough. Um, neither of us, when we started this, really knew what an organization was. We did not have put things together. Um, she uh, did such a beautiful job in taking the schedules, I would give her the schedule and then she would figure it out. And remember, we, we started out with 30 riders and then 60 riders, and we wound up with 140 riders. 140 riders to herd, uh, it's like a herd of cats. It's not so easy. Even though I must say, there was no, there was almost no temperamental, as a matter of fact, there was no temperamental uh, flare up uh, among the riders. They were, uh, everybody uh, just showed wonderful, uh, friendship and civility and most important an attitude that we were doing something that was worthwhile and so the, the talk to each other uh, the, the conversations uh, that we had and the quality of the readings up 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 
It was a joy to see. And Lindsay put it all together, organized it uh, beautifully. And she's a wonderful poet herself and gave a lovely reading. And to Alice, I can't thank Alice enough. Alice took this little bookstore. The whole thing was just dumb luck. Um, when uh, when uh, the book review in Huntington closed, uh, I had to scramble. And I didn't want to wait two weeks or three weeks or four weeks uh, and, and have a hiatus in which uh, it, the whole enterprise could fall apart. So I had two choices. One was Politics and Prose, a very a great, great bookstore, a big bookstore in Washington. And I remembered Alice. I remembered uh, Bird's books because she had interviewed me for a book or she had uh, interviewed me on a book that I had written before, Cold Moon. And while there's no question that politics and prose is impressive, we would have been lost there. Whereas with Alice, we were found. And uh, she stepped in so beautifully. And you can see how, uh, how expert uh, she was in everything uh, that she did and held this thing together. Uh, so she, and she is everything to us. She is all, she was not only a host of Ride America, she was the owner of a small independent bookstore, which is the center of, at the center of the heart of every writer in the country. So I thank you, Alice. And I thank my wife, Ginny, who is over here hiding at the other end of the table, who is my full partner. Come, you have to just come so that people can see how lovely you are. Um, the, uh, uh, who was my full partner in all these things, sat, sat through every episode with me, made wonderful suggestions as to people we could get, pairings that we could have. Uh, and uh, and she, in a way, she, it was all produced for Jenny. She was the ideal audience, a poet herself. She um, listened so carefully and applauded so much all the, uh, the wonderful work of the, uh, uh, the writers. So I thank you love. Hi there. I just want to thank all of you for making Write America possible and creating the connections that you have made. It's meant so much to me and I will miss it. Yeah, we will all miss it. And now I hand it over to you, Alice, with love and thanks. Well, first, I'd like to thank Lauren Limoncelli also, not only for hosting the first 29 episodes of Write America, but for helping me to jump into a new technology and for sharing all of her resources with me and reassuring me that all of this was well worth it. To the authors and poets who suffered through tech tests with me, your perseverance paid off. And we are left with an archive of some of the most memorable moments, not just of my life, but of many others as well. Special note to Alan Bergman when you sang Windows of Your Mind on your episode of Write America. It's the only version I hear anymore, and it forever warms my heart. Thank you. Each of you who have appeared, appeared on Write America are now my friends, who I would never have met if it were not for Roger Rosenblatt. Roger, I will miss the calls as we work through the finer points of each episode, the discussions of the mission of Write America, and all the stories, jokes, and tales along the way that have made you such a dear friend. Your vision is the glue that created and held Right America together, a brilliant, sometimes hidden two-year run of 96 archived episodes that I know so many others will continue to discover and cherish. We've all shared something brilliant and purposeful. You each have my gratitude, and I and my bookstore stand ready to continue my work to share your craft with others. You have my email and my thanks. May our paths cross again. Good night.